everybody, it's me, Mrs. Finner again, and I'm going to read to you now the chapter titled The First Tale. Before we start our reading, um, I want to kind of go over some of the characteristics of a fairy tale because we are going to be um, kind of comparing and contrasting the first tale and the next chapter, which is titled The Rest of the First Tale. Um, we're going to be looking at those two chapters and seeing if they follow some of the characteristics of a traditional fairy tale. So if you see me looking down, I'm going to look at my notes really quickly. So some common elements of fairy tales include it being a children's story, so a story that is made to um, share a lesson or tell a moral. It can take place in the past, includes the pattern of three, so for example, like in Aladdin, the three wishes. can include magical characters, royalty, so a prince or a princess who is good. Um, clearly defined good and evil characters. This is very unlike um, reality, right? Where it's very gray. Everyone has some good and evil, good and evil, I suppose, in them. So these are very defined roles in a fairy tale. And then they're going to also reflect the culture that the fairy tale has created. So with that, keep in mind that the monster is of Connor's um, thinking, whether it's real or not. That's for us to decide because the genre is um, magical realism. So let's jump into it. Here we go. Long ago, the monster said, before this was a town with roads and trains and cars, it was a green place. Trees covered every hill and bordered every path. They shaded every stream and protected every house. For there were houses even here, here even then, made of stone and earth. This was a kingdom. What? Connor said, looking around his backyard. Here? The monster cocked its head at him curiously. You have not heard of it? Not a kingdom around here, no, Connor said. We don't even have a McDonald's. <laughs> Nevertheless, continued the monster, it was a kingdom, small but happy, for the king was just a king, a man whose wisdom was born out of hardship. His wife had given birth to four strong sons, but in the king's reign he had been forced to ride into battles to preserve the peace of his kingdom. Battles against giants and dragons, battles against black wolves with red eyes, battles against armies of men led by great wizards. These battles secured the kingdom's borders and brought peace to the land, but victory came at a price. One by one, the king's four sons were killed by the fire of a dragon or at the hands of a giant or the teeth of a wolf or the spear of a man. One by one, all four princes of the kingdom fell, leaving the king only one heir, his infant grandson. This is all sounding pretty fairy tale-ish, Connor said suspiciously. You would not say that if you had heard the screams of a man killed by a spear, said the monster, or the cries of terror as he was torn to pieces by wolves. Now be quiet. And by and by, the wife's, the king's wife succumbed to grief, as did the mother of the young prince. The king was left with only the child for company, along with more sadness than one man should bear alone. I must remarry, the king decided. For the good of my prince and of my kingdom, if not for myself. And he did remarry. And remarry he did to a princess from a neighboring kingdom, a practical union that made both kingdoms stronger. She was young and fair, and though perhaps her face was a bit hard and her tongue a bit sharp, she seemed to make the king happy. So literally her face isn't literally hard and her tongue literally isn't sharp. So her face was hard, meaning maybe she wasn't the most... Um, physically attractive woman, and having a sharp tongue means um, she's kind of feisty or sassy. Um, she talks back. She doesn't just uh, stand still and look pretty, right? She uses her words. And back then, women really, uh, not that they weren't allowed to, but it was looked at very differently than today. Time passed. The young prince grew until he was nearly a man coming within two years of the 18th birthday that would allow him to ascend to the throne on the old king's death. These were happy days for the kingdom. The battles were over and the future seemed secure in the hands of the brave young prince. But one day the king grew ill. Rumor began to spread that he was being poisoned by his new wife. Whoa. Stories circulated that she had conjured grave magics to make herself look far younger than she actually was, and that beneath her youthful face lurked the scowl of an elderly hag. No one would have put it past her to poison the king, though he begged his subjects until his dying breath not to blame her. Ooh, plot twist. Love it. 
and so he died with still a year left before his grandson was old enough to take the throne. His queen, his step-grandmother, became reign, in, well, she reigned in his place and would handle all affairs of the state until the prince was old enough to take over. At first, to the surprise of many, her reign was a good one. Her countenance, her countenance, sorry guys, despite the rumors, was still youthful and pleasing, and she endeavored to carry on ruling in the manner of the dead king. The prince, meanwhile, had fallen in love. I knew it, Connor grumbled. These kinds of stories always have stupid princes falling in love. He started walking back to the house. I thought this was going to be good. With one swift movement, the monster grabbed Connor's ankles in a long, strong hand and flipped him upside down, holding him midair so his t-shirt rucked up and his heartbeat thudded in his head. As I was saying, the monster said, the prince had fallen in love. She was only a farmer's daughter, but she was beautiful and also smart, as the daughters of farmers need to be, for farms are complicated businesses. The kingdom smiled on the match, so it means that the people were accepting of them um, courting or being together. The queen, however, did not. Of course not, right? She had enjoyed her time as regnant. She had enjoyed her time reigning and felt a strange reluctance to give it up. She began to think that perhaps it was best that the crown remained in the family and that the kingdom be run by those wise enough to do it. And what could be a better solution than for the prince to actually marry her? So now the old lady wants to marry the prince? That's disgusting, Connor said, still upside down. She was his grandmother. I agree, Connor. Step-grandmother, <laughs> corrected the monster. Not related by blood, and to all intents and appearances, a young woman herself. Connor shook his head, his hair dangling. That's just wrong. He paused a moment. Can you maybe put me down? The monster lowered him to the ground and continued the story. The prince also thought marrying the queen was wrong. Good. And he said he would die before doing any such thing. He vowed to run away with the beautiful farmer's daughter and return on his 18th birthday to free his people from the tyranny of the queen. And so one night, the prince and the farmer's daughter raced away on horseback, stopping only at dawn to sleep in the shade of a giant yew tree. The yew tree, it's a motif, it's a reoccurring image, right, that's coming back in our story. You? Connor asked. Me, the monster said. But... Also only part of me. I can take any form of any size, but the yew tree is the shape most comfortable. The prince and the farmer's daughter held each other close in the growing dawn. They had vowed to be chaste until they were able to marry in the next kingdom, but their passions got the better of them, and it was not long before they were asleep and naked in each other's arms. Whoa, whoa. They slept through the day in the shadows of my branches, and night fell once again. The prince woke. Arise, my beloved, he whispered to the farmer's daughter, for we ride to the day where we will be man and wife. But his beloved did not wake. He shook her, and it was only as she slumped back in the moonlight that he noticed the blood staining the ground. <gasps> blood, Connor said, but the monster kept talking. The prince also had blood covering his own hands, and he saw a bloody knife on the grass beside them, rusting against the roots of the trees. Someone had murdered his beloved and done so in a way that made it look like the prince had committed the crime. <gasps> Conspiracies. The queen, cried the prince. The queen is responsible for this treachery. In the distance, he could hear the villagers approaching. If they found him, they would see the knife in the blood and they would call him a murderer. They had put him to death for his crime. And the queen would be able to rule unchallenged, Connor said, making a disgusted sound. I hope this story ends with you ripping her head off. There was nowhere for the prince to run. His horse had been chased away while he slept. The yew tree was his only shelter and also the only place he could turn for help. Now the world was younger then. The barrier between things was thinner, easier to pass through. The prince knew this and he lifted his head to the great yew tree and he spoke. The monster paused. What did he say? Connor asked. He said enough to bring me walking, the monster said. I know injustice when I see it. The prince ran toward the approaching villagers. The queen has murdered my bride, he shouted. The queen must be stopped. The rumors of the queen's witchery had been circulating long enough, and the young prince was so beloved by the people that it took very little for them to see the obvious truth. It took even less time when they saw the great green man walking behind him, high in the hills, coming for vengeance. Vengeance is like revenge. 
Connor glanced again at the monster's massive arms and legs, at its raggedy, toothy mouth, and its overwhelming monstrousness. He imagined what the queen must have thought when she saw it coming. Next page. He smiled. The subjects stormed the queen's castle with such fury that the stones of its very walls tumbled. Fortifications fell and ceilings collapsed, and when the queen was found in her chambers, the mob seized her and dragged her to the stake right then to burn her alive. Crazy. Good, Connor said, smiling. She deserved it. He looked up at his bedroom window where his grandmother slept. I don't suppose you can help me with her, he asked. I mean, I don't want to burn her alive or anything, but maybe just the story, the monster said is not yet finished. So that's where we will end for this chapter. Next chapter, we will read the rest of the first tale. I will see you then. Thanks, everybody.